Um, so my next talk is on upper extremity tendon transfers. And once again, I have no, uh, no relevant financial um, relationships to disclose. And uh, this is a very interesting topic to me over the years. And it's, it seems pretty rare to have to do one of these procedures, uh, but they do come up occasionally. Uh, maybe at the end, some people who have uh, more experience in this can, uh, can talk about some of their pearls of wisdom they've gained over the years. Um, so just a brief outline of this. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a little bit about the history of tendon transfers, where they come, where they come from, why uh, did we decide on, on doing these procedures, uh, some of the implications, uh, and spend a little time on principles. And a lot of the principles of tendon transfers are very similar to uh, what Dr. Simpson was talking about earlier with flexor tendon reconstruction. Um, and then go through some of the common tendon transfers. And then uh, briefly about the first operative care after these procedures. So just mainly for, for everyone in the room, what is a tendon transfer? And it's basically a procedure that relocates the insertion of a functioning muscle tendon unit in order to restore loss movement and function on other site. So it's basically repurposing a uh, muscle tendon uh, unit. And this came around in, uh, after the uh, polio epidemic in the uh, late 19th and early, early 20th century, uh, where primarily this was done in the lower extremities, uh, but with infantile paralysis. So uh, Conrad Misalski and Leo Mayer uh, came up with the concept of physiological tendon transfer. And once again, this was mainly for the lower extremities, but it's the same definition, just relocating a muscle tendon unit for a new function, uh, in this case, for the lower extremity. Uh, but really, it was the traumatic injuries of World War I and World War II, where pioneers uh, such as uh, Sterling Renau, uh, Guy Polgertow, uh, Joseph Boys, came up with the idea for uh, upper extremities. Here's the polar daft weave, uh, which is a very, very strong repair. We discussed that a little bit earlier. And mainly, you know, what were the indications with upper extremity injuries? And basically, these are peripheral nerve injuries that are either physically irreparable or uh, injuries that don't recover after nerve repair or grafting. Those that present blades or the motor end blades are gone. Uh, just complete traumatic loss of muscle tendon ruptures, uh, central neurologic deficits, or spinal cord injuries, and spinal palsy injuries, uh, or any other indications to do this. So overall, the principles, if you read any textbook on this, there's between seven to nine principles that you follow for this, and you basically need supple joints before transfer. Uh, if they're not, if they're not supple, then they good flexion and extension, and these procedures are not going to work. Uh, you need to have uh, soft tissue equilibrium, which basically means you, know, you just want the tendon to glide freely through the tissues. So you're going to have to do some kind of combination. You may have to wait two, three to four months before you can transfer uh, to let all the edema yeah, away uh, and make sure that there's no scar tissue. The other principle to, uh, to uh, focus on here is excursion. And excursion is a word we use, same thing as amplitude for, uh, for tendons. And it's basically the, the total excursion is the uh, added amount from, contra from contracted muscle to resting muscle with, with tendon with traction. And the flexors and extensors are pretty much at the, the same. At the 33 millimeters. The finger extensors are about 50, and the finger flexors are about 70. Uh, and this brings into the concept of the tenodesis effect, which I'm sure we're all sort of familiar with. And here, with wrist flexion, you have extension of the finger extensors. And with uh, wrist extension, you have flexion of uh, the fingers. And this comes into play when you're thinking about what transfers you can use because you want to, because your, uh, your extensors are sort of 
synergistic with your flex extensors of the wrist are synergistic with the flexors of your fingers. And you also want a donor of adequate strength. So all the upper extremity muscles are ranked uh, in terms of strength. Uh, the strongest ones are the brachioradialis and the flexor corpialis, and the uh, lighter ones, the smaller muscles, or things like the palmaris longus, the extensor balls of the which is on a relative scale. This is important to keep in mind when you're trying to decide what muscles to use and which ones to transfer uh, for your uh, tendon transfer. Just also keep in mind that when you do transfer them, they sort of lose a little bit of strength. You also want an extendable donor. Uh, so you, know, you have three wrist extensors. If you lose one to or borrow one for to perform another function. You're going to have a little bit of redundancy, so you have the other wrist extensors uh, functioning uh, in their original, uh, for their original purpose. And you want a straight line of pull, so that uh, takes into account you know, any any change of direction will, significant, will significantly diminish the force of what the tendon transfer can produce. And you know you may require a little bit of dissection, you know, approximately or distally, to you know, create that. Straight line of pull. And once again, uh, bringing up the concept of synergy, uh, certain muscle groups work together. And ideally, you know, one of the good examples here is flexor corpus malaris transfer to EDC. Once again, taking into effect that, uh, taking into account that TNDs is effect. And these are easier. These types of transfers are easier to retrain and uh, shorter to rehab. It's theoretical. So another, another principle is to get the correct tension. So you want to slightly overcorrect uh, when you're uh, doing these procedures. Uh, and you can see the rest, the rest of the cascade of the digits. You know, it, it sort of increases you know, you have a little bit more flexion as you go from radial to longer. So as far as operative planning for these procedures, you can ask three, ask yourself three questions. So, you know, just kind of breaking it down, what functions need replacing, uh, what donor muscles are available, and which transfers are required to achieve uh, the surgical goals. And you have uh, three main types of nerve palsy. So you have a radial nerve palsy, median nerve palsy, and ulnar nerve palsy. Uh, the radial nerve palsy, you have a wrist drop, and you've lost wrist extension. You've lost finger extension. Thumb extension. This uh, diagram here kind of shows shows that. So you know you want to go from there. You know, why? You know, how would you how would you correct this? And mainly, you know, what would cause this? What sort of injury would cause this? One of the more common uh, injuries that would cause this is a uh, humeral fracture. So you, know, you have a distal third humerus fracture. Uh, this can uh, put tension or actually lacerate the, uh, the nerve at that level. And then you have your radial nerve palsy. And this is the most at risk for uh, distal and third fractures. Uh, it occurs in about 18 to 22 percent of fractures. And the name associated with that is the Holstein Lewis distal Lewis fracture. So what can you do if you know your nerve grafting, your nerve repair doesn't work, and it's the time has passed? You know, one way to do this to restore wrist extension is you take your coronator uh, teres to ECRB and you uh, basically disinsert it and you come around the brachioradialis and try to go subcutaneous uh, to the uh, distal aspect of the uh, ECRB. And here you can take a little bit of the uh, periosteum from the bone and that would give you something a little more to sub to. Next, uh, for radial nerve palsy, if you've lost your thumb extension, a very straightforward uh, tendon transfer to do is palmaris longus to extensor palsis longus. And here you bring in the, the idea, you know, distally you want to dissect a little bit so you get more of a direct line and pull. And, uh, and 
when you borrow from the palmaris longus and you repurpose your palmaris longus for extension of the thumb, you haven't really lost much in terms of by borrowing from, from that tendon. Uh, restoration of finger extension is a little more extensive, and you can use either the flexor carpi radialis or the flexor carpi ulnaris or FDS. Historically, the FCU was used, and uh, this diagram shows this where your FCU comes and uh, basically wraps around and you uh, reattach that to the extensor digitorum communis. And this sort of violates one of those uh, uh, concepts of single tendon, single, single U function, because you're putting it to, uh, to all the digits and basically uh, assign them all together. Uh, the problem with this is you have a little radiant deviation uh, due to loss of on the side of motor, and it's, it's essential for the activities of the hammering and throwing. So you have wisdom to that. The other is the brand transfer. And here you're just taking the flexor copper radialis and coming around. And here you can see it's basically attached to the EDC at that level. And once again, you're dissecting it a little bit more so that you have more of a direct line of pull. And all of these are, are subcutaneous uh, because you don't want any other muscles to kind of compress on top of, of, of your tendon transfer. Still a more complicated one is the boys superficialis transfer. And here you're going from the um, FDS from the third to the EDC and the FDS from the four, uh, fourth digit to the EMP and the EPL. Um, you have a little bit better excursion with a fused wrist, uh, but the disadvantages here are that it's not a uh, synergistic uh, transfer Medium nerve palsy is a little bit different in that uh, you, uh, you really want sensation back uh, with that, and even a tendon transfer to, to recover your, your function uh, is not going to work as well if you, if you have a reestablished sensation. So you know, your nerve repair is probably a little bit more important with medium nerve palsy versus uh, radial nerve palsy. So here, what have you lost with medium nerve palsy? You've lost opposition lost your phenol you know, muscles and lost your index and thumb flexion. And you have what's called the hand of benediction, uh, which you can, you can see here. So restoration of opposition uh, or components blasting, it's a complex movement of uh, reduction, flexion, and combination. And the ideal insertion uh, for transfer is the APD. Um, oftentimes you'll also need to release a contracture uh, First web space. And the options here are, once again, you have three main options. You have the FDS to the ring, you have the extensor indices proprius, and the uh, palmaris longus. So once again, those last two, you know, you're losing, you know, you know, when you use those for the new function, you know, it's not costing you a lot because you, know, you have a little bit of redundancy there. So using your EIP or PL uh, doesn't really this was described uh, in the particular ring of flexor digitorum superficialis uh, in 1938. Described this. Uh, here you can either do a pulley with the uh, FCU or you can actually wrap that tendon around the isoform bone. This will weaken the grip a little bit, uh, but you've, you know, you've tried to reorient this so you have a little bit more of a, uh, a new direction of pull by uh, rewriting it around. Uh, this shows the extensor indices uh, proprius, once again just explaining that it's a little more expendable than the others. And this you have to take quite a quite a bit of length and uh, wrap space to go the way around. Uh, for medium nerve palsy, the third, the third option is taking the palmaris longus, uh, especially after uh, if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, it's Easy operation to do uh, because it's, it's it's right there where you're making your, uh, uh, your access decisions anyway, <laughs> and there's no there's really no loss of any function. Uh, if you're restoring index and thumb flexion from high high palsy, you can break your radialis 
to flex with hosses longus. And this is particularly good transfer because you have a very strong uh, breaker radialis that can be used for your uh, uh, for flexion, uh, basically flexion of the flow. And so if you're bringing us to only nerve palsy, this is a uh, this is the claw hand of uh, ulnar palsy. It's kind of like the hand of benediction as well, except that you have hyperextension of the metacarpal phalangeal joints. And uh, sometimes this can be uh, cared for without the tendon transfer. You can do uh, some other procedures uh, to kind of mitigate that a little bit. But the deficits with ulnar neural palsy are you know, have this decline deformity, uh, you have weakened grip. So you only have one third to one half of the hand strength, and you've lost 80% of your tension strength with this. You also have asynchronous motion uh, and flexion of the IP joints before the micro financial joints. Uh, and it, this is all further delineated into low and high, uh, high policies, uh, which the other ones are there too. For the ulnar nerve palsy, you want to restore flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint and do a chastened suture. It's a fairly straightforward procedure, uh, which is depicted here uh, to your flexor to joint profundus. Uh, and to restore uh, opposition, you can do ECRB or brachial balance uh, to the uh, adductor palsies. Uh, may require, will require a tendon graft uh, and a pulley. It's a bit more complex. Uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle of the FDS is also another option. So for all your palsy, as I mentioned, you can just do like a dorsal bony block or a capsulodesis or a capsulography. Uh, and this will uh, sort of decrease the amount of hyperextension in the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint. Uh, and then you can also do uh, tendon transfers to the uh, metacarpal phalangeal flexion. So procedure where you're just basically taking the uh, flexor to superficialis, rerouting it over to uh, basically to itself, and that will prevent the uh, MCP hyper extension. And the other one is the stylus banal, uh, which is a bit more complex. As far as proximal nerve palsies go, you, if you want to restore elbow flexion, you have the pec major. Dismissed the worst side as donors, the recipient uh, the is the biceps. Uh, the, other, the other option for elbow uh, flexion is just uh, taking the common flex from mass and putting it to a more proximal point in the humerus. Uh, other transfers for tendon rupture. So, extensor pollicis longus is one of the more common uh, ruptures for just radius fractures. Actually, when I, when I was looking at the this, it's actually good. It's more common than that you just described, but overall it's not very good. It's not actually good. And yeah, for remicular turn, extensor tendon ruptures are most common from an ulna to radial uh, direction, um, and you, know, you can have two or more uh, tendons in the EIP, Palmaris lungs, or FDS. As far as the aftercare rehabilitation, you want a position of minimal tension on your repairs. Uh, wound check and resplint in about two weeks. Uh, remove the splint in four weeks, increase mobilization and muscle retraining in about six weeks. Uh, and then continue with strengthening, all goes well. And we have full activity in 12 weeks and back to work. Uh, 